she would meet a bald-headed preacher. <laughs> and uh, I love her, and she's a blessing. And I'm proud to have her with me because so many times she doesn't get to go with me. And so that's a blessing. So anyway, and it's her fault that I'm bald. Before I met her, I had long, blonde, wavy hair. No, I didn't. Praise God. Are you, are you teachable this morning? Let's get into the Word. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm not going to keep you long, praise God, but I'm going to keep you long enough to impart. We talked last night about returning to the garden, remember? If you were here, we talked about uh, uh, John 3, 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. To the degree that you renew your mind is the degree you will prosper and be in health. Your mind is the place where your soul and your emotion and your logic and your thinking are. When it comes to your spirit, it is perfect. The Bible says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So where is the body of Christ? Would you not agree with me this morning that God wants the good life for you? God wants the good life for you. He does not, he does not wait you, want you to wait for in the sweet by and by. And too much, too high of a percentage of the church has an escapist mentality. They are saying... I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. Some glad morning, because they haven't learned to seize the day. Carpe diem and what God has already done through the body of Christ. See, religion will always defer for you what God has for you today. Because religion has no power. I said last night, the religion is man's idea of how to get right with God and get into the blessings of God and not God's idea to how to get them to you. That's what religion is. Religion has no power. It has no authority. And so it has to give you something to keep you hooked on it until something else happens. And in too much of the church, it's death, it's poverty, and it's an a, a escapism mentality. But you are born and raised to have authority and have dominion here on planet Earth. Now, now we, we talked about this a little last night, but I want to uh, kind of break into it here. Let's evaluate some of the things that we know about Scripture. The Bible says that God is spirit and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Is that right? No one has seen God, the Bible says. Daniel had a vision of God, and it says that he was a fire from his loins up. And he was a fire from his loins down. Hallelujah. I like fire. Is there a biker in here that doesn't like flames? Yeah? I mean, even a hot rod. Nothing looks cooler on a hot rod or a bike than flames. Amen? But this was the picture that Daniel had in his spirit. In Revelations, we see the picture of Jesus coming, and it talks about his raiment being as white. Amen? And the, the spirit, the word coming from him is like a flaming sword. No one has seen God. God is spirit. But we know, let me ask you this, is God king? Amen. He is king over the spirit realm. Amen? So where does Christianity get this idea that when we die, we will go to heaven and we will reign? There's only one king over heaven. He created man in his image, in his likeness, to rule and to reign in a natural realm called earth. Right here. Right now. Through what Christ has done. Now, I'm not discounting heaven. I believe that we will go to heaven. But the Bible also says that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Amen? And John the Revelator reads and writes. He, say, yeah, he reads and he writes. But he writes, he says, Behold, I saw a new earth and a new heaven. I contend 
If the giftings and the calling of God are without repentance, that we may go to heaven for a while, but we will be returned in a new and glorified body to rule and reign, the Bible says, with Him. Who? Jesus. So if there's a time we go to heaven, the time that we stay in heaven, I believe that it's going to be a teaching time so that we understand who we are and what we didn't grasp here on earth. I was telling you last night, a, a brother of ours called Jesse Duplantis had a, a vision of heaven. And, and he says in his book, in his CD series called Close Encounters of the God Kind, when he got up there, he saw people going to school. What were they learning? They were learning those things that they didn't hear here on earth. They were learning those things that had been robbed from them by the enemy. So why don't we just jump ahead and start learning some of this stuff right now and start ruling and reigning here on earth and quit waiting for in the sweet by and by. Why? Because we are called to be a window of heaven. We are called to reflect the kingdom of God. But we cannot do that until we do what Jesus said in Matthew 4, 17 when he says, repent, change your way of thinking because the kingdom of God is here. It's here. And we need to start operating in a physical and a spiritual realm because that is God, how God created us. And that's how he has ordained us. And by the grace of Jesus Christ and his work at the cross, that is what we have now been redeemed to. Amen? I, I told you last night that I was in Detroit here a few weeks ago, and I really appreciated that, uh, that YouTube video because these God's DJs that I went to this rave and, and I told you all the occurrences of that and what happened to me, but these kids, that's what they do. They take sounds like you just heard. And they'll take old praise and worship and new praise and worship and sounds that they hear on the street and they mix it into these computers. And then they pump it out and it's praising God. And then they put lights, laser lights with it. And it may not be my cup of tea, but guess what? It's ministering. It's ushering in the presence of God. Who would have thought that a bunch of whales, which sounded like somebody snoring... <laughs> We won't mention any names. <laughs> Who would have thought that a bunch of whales could be turned into praise and worship? Huh? Who would have thought? So if it's not your flavor of ice cream, don't shoot it down. Praise God. If it's bringing God glory, if it's ushering somebody in. See, oh, hallelujah, I'm getting over there. See, we've got to quit limiting praise and worship to three fast songs and two slow ones. And we got to quit calling church and fellowship coming in and sitting on a pew and never talking to the person next to us. Church and praise and worship is a lifestyle. It doesn't just happen on Sunday morning and Sunday nights. It doesn't just happen on Wednesday night. It is a lifestyle. And if you're only getting praise and worship through even the great music we had here, if you're only getting praise and worship through three fast songs and two slow ones, well, it's like Jim Morrison said, break on through to the other side. Somebody says, who's Jim Morrison? <laughs> Some of us knew. Yeah, so, praise God, I preach what I know. Amen? Open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over every spirit of religion. I come against every preconceived notion or doctrine that would hinder your people from hearing the Spirit of God and being catapulted into what you have for them, the gifts that you have hidden from the foundation of the earth. And I say in the name of Jesus that today we are transformed, that we are renewed faith by faith in glory to glory into the exact expressed image of who you are and who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, most of the time when we look at this, we expect to see the elements of the communion up here, right? The body, which is the bread, and the blood, which is the wine. And that's great. 
But folks, let's get past some of the iconic things that we have turned into religion in the church. What things am I talking about? So many times we think communion is a little piece of cracker and a shot of grape juice. So many times that we think is baptism is just getting wet. But it's not. The baptism is meant to symbolize the death of the old man and the rising of the new. The communion is to do in remembrance of what Christ has done. And communion and baptism are just like a relationship with God. It's just like praise and worship in church. It's a constant thing. It was a great icon for teaching until we turned it into a religion. See, communion is not to be limited to Sunday morning, Sunday night, or some churches, Christmas and Easter. Some places when I need something from God. Communion is a lifestyle. God wants you to have continuous, all the time, communion with His Spirit. He wants you to be to the point that Paul said, in Him I live and breathe, and in Him I have my being. In Him I have my being. See, God's idea of communion is He doesn't want you to ever step out of it. And how many of you know, if you're in communion with God, He's got the answer for every question in your life? Let me, oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. What are you working on? Are you believing God for finance? Are you believing God for healing? What are you believing God for? It's like the sister said, and I said last night, just take it. It's been provided through the grace of God at the cross through Jesus Christ. If he's telling you to do something, that is faith and your works. See, this is like our brother said this morning. Faith always demands a corresponding action. Faith always demands a corresponding action. Corinthians says it like this. I believe, therefore I said. And see, the corresponding action sometimes can just be standing. Stand, be still, and know that I am God. That's one of the toughest Works of faith there can be sometimes. To sit there and know that he is God. And not engage your mouth to say something opposite of what God is already saying. You talk about faith and works. That's a big work sometimes. When the pressure's pushing in. And the, and the situation seems to be getting worse instead of better. And God is telling you to just stand. Ooh. Somebody says, well, that's not works. Yes, it is. See, the works is whatever God tells you to do. Amen? That's what the works is. And when we get down to it, that's what the seed is. See, we, we got to quit grabbing our wallet when we hear the word seed. See, we've, we've been tricked in the, in the church and in religion when we hear the word seed, we grab our wallet. Kind of like the federal government. Well, if I have a problem, I'll just throw more money, of it, money at it and it'll go away. Oh, it doesn't operate this way in Oklahoma? <laughs> We've got a problem. Well, we'll just give them more money. Maybe it'll go away. 